worth, and this is my own personal opinion, I would prefer always to see these as far away from a private property owner's property line as possible. Um, we have some flexibility. I don't know if there's any care that this board, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's the appetite for the board to take that on. Um, I do have something that's related to it. There was a question, and I don't know if this is more for staff, um, based on um, when you get to the minimum lot sizes and setbacks on this, um, as it relates to our actual ordinance. I understand they're on a 25-acre parcel of property right now, but they currently lease, they're leasing 100 feet by 100 feet, is that correct? That's correct. So, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe it's silent to it, but how does, you know, in a couple of years of Basically, they are leasing 100 by 100, but getting five acres. Is that my understanding? Because if this could not go smaller than five acres at any point, and I'm not sure if I mean, that's essentially what they purchased was five acres of land at the minimum. Smaller than five acres. Is that, am I correct in that reading of this? That's the way it's structured. Is that at a starting point, it needs to be 25 acres or more. But if and the intent behind that, the event that we follow this closely with the council, which is what most of you, is that um, the council did want to allow for very large properties to still be maybe subdivided in the future um, and not prevent development on, say, a 25 or 50 acre parcel just because there's one tower, but still provide a pretty sizable parcel around that tower and what's going to be subdivided. So that's where the 25 acres comes in. Starting point for this, but then should the Parker family or future owner decide to do a subdivision, um, the land area around the tower could shrink, but only shrink down to, to no less than five acres. So before this is approved, the planning board needs assurance that that, that, that is the understanding and that should our development project be proposed or something change with this property. That the land around the tower remain five acres or greater, and that goes setbacks. Who would make that public okay. All right, good point. Good point. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, all right, so that I mean, it looks like my colleagues here have addressed this. I, I, I am supportive of a 150 foot uh, foundation to support a 150 foot tower for the future. Um, I agree with my colleagues, Susan. One, one tower with three carriers on it is better than three towers at 120 feet. So. Uh, and I think um, I think that's it. Like I said, I, I would, would like to just put this out there. And at some point, all of us might actually be sitting out there instead of here talking about a cell tower abutting our property. And, and I bring it up in the context of how close to your property line you really want. And 180 feet is actually less frontage than I have in my current house. I'm, I'm zoned RF and I've got a, a 200 foot frontage on my boat. So the tower would actually be closer to my property line than the actual length of my property line. And that's that's something I look at. When I walk down my driveway, go to my mailbox, I look at the length of my property line and say, that tower could actually be closer than what I'm looking at right now to my own property. And I want us to consider that as a board you guys feel free to shoot me right down right now. <laughs> but I, I hate the thought of not, you know, if we're going to prove one thing, I mean, we're setting the precedent, and I would rather just start right out of the gate that they get as far away as from a property line as our ordinance allows. And that's just my personal opinion. Thank you. Well said. Mike Thank you. Uh, I think you've done a good job meeting the ordinance. I appreciate that. Um, how do you answer it? Mean, I think you touched upon it a little bit when you first began discussing tonight, but how do you answer uh, a citizen who says my coverage is fine now um, without bringing out all the engineering that we had seen in previous weeks, uh, talking a little bit about the demand in the system, et cetera, et cetera? Um, 
can you talk about is this more about meeting future demand as it as uh, more than it is current demand? Yeah, well, I'll talk and then Chip can jump in if I run a bell. So there, this is uh, to address current demand and a current um, deficiency in the coverage in this area. And as I think folks now, we're trying to address a couple different areas in town where we think that the demand is inadequate. So this is an evaluation of what we have today based on uh, what are kind of the expected anticipated uses of folks with their phones, which includes both voice and data access through the cell phone signal to do what everybody's doing with their telephones these days. So when it was almost all uh, voice, uh, it was less of an impact on the system. Um, the addition of data puts a significant tax on the system. And also there's fluctuations based on the number of users who may be using um, the site at any one point in time. And that could change. Uh, that changes. Um, so it may be that folks uh, can get cell service. They may be able to get it in some corner of their house, but not the other, or some piece of the property, but not the other, or some portion of the road, that not the other. Um, but the, the service is, is, um, has been deemed inadequate under current usage and for the kind of the broadest average of the type of use that we're using our cell phones for, um, and also with an eye to making sure that you have continuous coverage. So unlike uh, if you were building a rate, an FM station, you know, it's, it's, it's okay if you're, as you're driving around or you're walking around your house, for the signal to go and come back as it comes back. But with a cell phone service, when you lose the signal, you drop the call, you lose the access to the internet, and you have to start all over again. So the, the standard is a little bit higher to make sure our phones work continuously throughout the, the service territory. Um, but that doesn't mean that someone's not gonna get a signal here and there, so that will happen. Now you said uh, uh, the purpose of this tower will meet current uh, do, do you also look towards what 10, 15, 20 yes. years of, of anticipated development might? Absolutely, and, and some of that is done with antenna upgrades that uh, generate more power, so as the number of users, the population of the town grows, and it's the population that taxes the signal, um, you can alter the uh, antennas to provide more power, which uh, essentially doesn't change the footprint of the coverage, but when more people are trying to get that tower, it allows it to function um, as, it, as it would you know, before you had that other... Good so essentially, people. this kind of design, you can improve for future demand without any real... That's uh, correct. And a, a lot of what Chip does are antenna swap outs that are usually code enforcement officer only, so that's happening all throughout the city. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. I, the, the, uh, the pictures of the camouflaged uh, monopole, yes. the uh, pine tree, is that at 120 feet? Yes. Yes, that's all, one shows one. all the pictures of the poles and the monopine are at one point. Although the balloons show the two. That's correct. Right. And you can see, in particular the one from the subdivision, if the pine tree went to 150, it would look different. And, and you know, 90 to 120 is usually the best range for a monopine in which, uh, for someone that were to come in to the neighborhood after the project was built, um, wouldn't be something that would jump out at them. At a, 150 to 190 feet, um, usually it just doesn't look uh, natural and um, you end up using different techniques. Well, uh, I appreciate you offering that, uh, that option. Uh, I, I think that our ordinance, although uh, I think this is our first go at it, if you will, or maybe second if you count the APT on the fishing game, mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would think that uh, camouflage monopole in a residential area would be where everyone would start the discussion as opposed to something that might be considered for a regular model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think given the height, that would be our recommendation as well, having reviewed the simulations. Um, you, as you can see from the simulations, it does a significantly better job of blending in um, to the existing vegetation with that design. Is there a, uh, th this is in a uh, operating gravel area, a gravel yard? This, this site? A portion of the site is. Is there any, any blasting in the, in the uh, railway? Or is it just? It's all, it's all, it's so there's no blasting? I don't, I don't think so. And certainly, we've had discussions with the property owner about, you know, Chip has had those about what's necessary for the tower to be there. And 
and sorted out the kind of operational issues. So we're comfortable that this is a good site. And I think I asked a, a couple of meetings ago about uh, what the future expansion of the Connors Road subdivision, what this might do to that. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, further uh, illustration of that? Or yeah, Jay was, Jay was helpful. He sent us a copy that shows the subdivision and the kind of the hammerhead that's, that's potentially dedicated to the town. Uh, we think that, you know, given the 25 to 5 issue and the setbacks that given that it's a 60 acre lot that certainly the property owner is going to be able to structure future subdivision in a way that would work and you know locate a road in a way that would make sense for pass through traffic it, it could be a kind of coterminous with our access that would require an upgrade it may move to the southeastern corner of the site um, so that's one of the things that we don't know but given the size of the parcel there's significant flexibility in kind of dealing with future uses thank you thank you mr Jim. Thank you. John? First off, I'd like to thank you for explaining the standards. I want to say something to the public. Um, this has been an ongoing process for probably over a year that we've discussed this, and there's been all kinds of public hearings designing these standards. And we have a four step process. And this particular site is the third step of the process. Um, we have to go through each step first. And if it doesn't fit in that, then we have to go next. We can't approve this if it goes in the second step. So it's right here if everybody wants to see the standards. And these things were approved last October. So it's very difficult for us, and it's a long process for everybody to go through these standards on what we have to do. So the fact that it's not been disclosed is incorrect. I agree with Nick on the 150 foot uh, foundation design. I think that should be considered it's probably nothing in the future, but 20 years from now, that could be a possibility. And we need, we need to look at that now. As far as the uh, model pine, so to speak, how long do the needles last? <laughs> They're good. They're tough. Uh, ice storms, um, and we would expect, you know, a condition of approval would be that there's any damage or uh, harm to the, you know, the, the garage lines. You'll read my mind. Yes, yeah, sir. So that needs to be a condition for years down the road. Yes. You know, yeah, the five years from now, it could be just a bunch of sticks that can there and they need to be replaced. And, and the foundation will be designed uh, for a 150 foot monopine, which means there is some additional ice coating associated with that potentially, and that's all factored into the design of the, of the facility. Well, I agree with Susan, they're not necessarily very pretty, but they're a little better than just a monopine. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, I just got a couple of things because I've been hearing distances and I'm looking at the map. It seems to me that the distance between the tower and Conical Drive is more than 180 feet. What am I missing? It, it, it yeah, may be down to the other end uh, on Blunt Train Road. Maybe closer. Yeah, so the closest property line would be um, the 253 Broad Turn Road, or Brenda Reed, mm -hmm. um, and that's 255 feet from the center of the tower to that point on the property line. That that would be the closest, and that's the, the minimum setback that's either 150 and then you can go up to 300% of the tower height. The distance to the hammerhead at the end of Carter Brook Drive is probably 820 feet or so. Um, that distance, I'm just kind of looking at you shift the 803 foot setback line over to the road. It's about 800 feet. So it's, it's right now, it's currently designed to be much farther from Carterville Drive. There is a field over there that's been cleared or it's been cleared for a very long time. So um, although uh, moving it in the direction of Carterville Drive would get it farther away from Brenda Reed's property, it moves it closer to the clearing, um, which might not be. Um, even if you know you wanted to think about extending the, the setbacks, it might not be the best place to put it. And there's significant vegetation to the southwest towards uh, the, the Reeds property that offers it, um, such that moving it a little bit farther away probably won't alter the, the visual impact that much. Um, the one, uh, if you look at the photo simulations, and if you go to B, just to follow up on your question, there is. You go to the um, 
third page, which says um, Driven's verified visibility map, two mile radius. Um, this over shot shows in green all of the roads where the balloons couldn't be seen at 120 feet. And site seven is the one that is kind of closest to the property that's closest to the south um, west of the site. So if you go through the Sims to where you see photo location seven, and it says from Tibbetts Road, um, you see the before and after. Uh, the first one shows the red balloon. It's very hard to see the yellow balloon, but it's right above the tree access. Then when the tree goes in, this is one of the best uses of the monopine because it will really blend in quite a bit. And so that was the one um, that was at the kind of 255 foot setback level to the, to the property line. And moving it another 40 or 50 feet away might provide a little bit, but you probably couldn't tell from this distance. Um, it would move it closer to Carter Brook, so our thinking was kind of where we had put it was a nice blend of the two. But, you know, you're absolutely right. You, you, in every one of these cases, I think it's reasonable to say, look, put it at 300%. Just let's start there. And then for you to consider whether it's actually okay to move it towards the, the 150%. And you might have a kind of a policy in reviewing these where you start at 300% from the closest property line and you have the applicant explain or show you why it either doesn't matter or it might be better to, to move it closer to 150. Um, we don't think it would matter if you move it 300% away from this property line, but certainly that's a reasonable way to look at your ordinance to try to make sure you're protecting the closest part. Have you heard from her? I'm sorry, what was that? Have you heard from uh, Mrs. Reed or Ms. Reed? I don't believe so. We've only seen the comments that um, have been submitted to the town that Dan has forwarded to us. I know you've addressed this, but uh, uh, just for the public record, well, case scenario, it ceases, and we have an abandonment yes. clause. Uh, are you aware of it? And yes, okay. there's two steps. The first one is we would be ordered by the code officer to remove it um, if it's discontinued, I think it's for a year. Um, and then you will have a surety in place that will equal the uh, cost to remove the tower in the event Verizon Wireless disappeared and wasn't able to do it, and you would have those resources to take the tower down yourself. And, and the last, uh, uh, would it kind of mention something about uh, DEP? Is the DEP involved? Uh, we have to figure out whether we need a permit by rule. I don't think we need a permit rule by rule for the crossing because there's an existing culvert, but Woodard and Kern had asked us to do a hydrological study to ensure that the culvert is working as it was intended. So we're going to circle back with our engineers to respond to that comment and confirm that the culvert is the right size and the right location and it's actually allowing the, what constitutes a very small intermittent stream to, to move under the road. Um, I'll, I'll have an initial call into DEP. I don't think we're going to require, we might need a, a NERPA permit by rule if we're doing anything that is not associated with the crossing that's within 75 feet, um, but I'm going to check with the engineers and nail that down. And we're aware of your... Um, I don't know if it applies to permit by rule, if that's the 14 day notice, but your desire to have state federal approvals in hand prior to the planning board's final determination. So Correct. we'll nail that one down. Okay. Um, so I have, I mean, anything else from the board that we've dealt with? I think, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious, are you, are you folks kind of leading towards the model time? Is that, is that yes, we're, we're actually willing to do either. I think we, it doesn't matter to us. Um, this, the, the service will work perfectly both ways. It's really up to you folks to decide which one's going to Because I'm looking at 15 cotter, cotter for variety of the On the pine? pine well, I'm looking at the pine, I'm also looking at the tower. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think the pine, <laughs> the pine stands out to me, where I think after a while you might just ignore the tower. But I may be mistaken. Have we seen them? Yeah, they These pictures? Yes. Please.
somehow or another before the final decision is made, we need to have something made on the tower without the mall pines going to look like. Because I think we have a lot of idealistic ideas here about what that pine looks like. It doesn't look like a pine. And the taller it gets, the more it doesn't look like a pine. Now, that's just my opinion, but I think that we need something other than these photos, something a little closer that shows us what the difference is. You really do. You get used to the pole. Otherwise, you go out and have a little cocktail party and invite your friends in to laugh at the pine. Um, it really doesn't look like a pine. Well, and what we've tried to do, and you'll see, I mean, the first one that I saw was off of U2 near Hans, uh, oh, yeah. in, case, in, My in Massachusetts, which was a bottle brush covering the top 15 feet, and then there was a gray pole that was 20 feet before the tree level. It was just absolutely horrific. Um, you know, we've done them. We, we did a, a simulation for a model pine that was going to go in at the base of Mount Batty. We've done them in Bar Harbor. Excuse me, I don't want us to go spend any more time sure. on this. We just ask that you bring us examples of those. Okay. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Because we're not at that point tonight. But could we please just have examples? Some additional details. Yeah, details on that we can actually look at and say yes and no. Well, if, if, if I may, if I may, just sure. to address that. I'm happy to bring you sample photos. The kicker is this, the kicker is vantage point. I could bring you a, a photograph from Carterville Road in Canterbury, New Hampshire, looking at a 180 foot monopine, and it looks unbelievable. It's 180 feet tall. Where's the difference? The difference is the vantage point. Okay, I could bring you photographs of the site down in Mass, he's talking about down in Jersey, off the Garden State Parkway, that they think monopines look terrible. Well, um, make us that's, why, that that's, why we, that's why we prepared these photo sims for you. But make us one that comes from here with a photo soon that I can actually get up close to, you know? I don't know. Yeah, so what, 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 it doesn't show me anything. So what, what to do, I just want to make sure we can be respond. closer to it. I'm sorry, I don't mean, I, I know I'm out of order, but you don't have to look at it. He has to look at it, I have to look at it, my neighbor has to look at it. Why don't you let us decide, rather than you sit here and decide whether philosophically you like a pine tree or you like a pole. Right? Man. Okay. Unfortunately, you don't get to make that decision. I do. And the bottom line is, we will ask you what you would like. And all I'm asking them to do is to provide us with something that you can look at up close and personal so that you know exactly what you, you want. If, if, so provide us, if you provide us the opportunity to look at This is being broadcast, and they can't hear you. Oh. All right. So, yeah, well, I want to make sure we can get you, we can get you some specs. What we asked them, um, then to do was to, to render as the monopine what we would propose to build, but if there's additional information that you need to evaluate that, um, I don't know if, if that's something that we can work with Dan on, but like for Susan, I want to make sure that we get you the kind of information that you're looking for. I see we all need to this. Well, uh, we can work with the applicant on getting more detailed information on contemporary monopine that we think would be most sort of camouflaging and, and more up-to-date version of maybe what's been you've seen in other areas. So that's what you've got here. This is our best crack at it, but um, but certainly feedback from the board or through the people who are closest through the board. Um, you know that we're trying to do a tapered style that isn't the bottle brush. So that's the one design change that has been newer with these. Uh, Projects, um, but if there is. Let me jump in. Yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, sure. Because this is the way I'm going to end it. Is I think the message has been said. I think if you work with the planning staff, okay, and if anybody in the public has any suggestions, send them to the planning staff. Uh, so that way we have the conduit as to what may be preferred by the residents and what you think is best. And planning staff can coordinate all of that. Okay? Um, anything else? Would you? Yes. Uh, would it be possible um, in the next iteration of this map to see what five acres looks like around your tower? Just that dotted line that's colored to say. Was the tower the center? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, not necessarily the center. I think this is my point. Because if I heard correctly earlier, you would be forced to maintain two of your distance lines if it ever shrunk down to five acres. That's the right. So if you maintain 
343 on one side and 255 on the other. I'm wondering what that parcel ends up looking like from there. Um, I did a quick calculation. That's it's almost four acres of land right there. Um, in that hard corner? In that hard corner. So, yeah. yeah. so what I'm saying is, is you're actually, if you got to five acres, that tower is on the other side that we don't have a delineated delineated lineage on could be 20, 20 feet away from the property line. Now, I know that can't happen, yeah. but I want to see how far that, because you're going to have to maintain, maintain the one, you have to be 180 at least, right? It would is be 150%. I mean, I guess what I'm seeing, is I'm seeing kind of a floating box moving over it and where are the different options where it could go. I, I you wouldn't have a choice, though. What I'm saying is your two lines where you're maintaining them now, according to have to stay the same. Yeah, I mean, I think if we were going to move, uh, what would happen is it would create a new boundary line that would have to be 180 feet. All the all four corners of this square would have to be at least 180 feet away in all directions. So you couldn't move it too far into a corner. It would have to be 180 and 180. Um, but the, the block could move that into any of the four corners of that 180 by 180, depending on how a final subdivision plan would look. And maybe... The whole corner would sit there, but the boundary would have to be 180 feet away. Correct. Um, I guess the question is, and Dan probably hasn't even thought about it, if it's possible to reduce it to 100%, I don't know if it's possible to go down to 100% and subject to its subdivision, but that could be an issue as well. But uh, there's flexibility. So I'm not sure how. There's it flexibility to go to 100%. But I'm curious to see what that line looks like. Uh, just, and then, you know, maybe I'm the only one, but I, I want to see what five acres looks like. I want to know what this looks like 30 years from now. And I'm sure we work with Dan on it. I know, it's a tall order. But it, look, if I'm not going to be careful, what am I doing here? Um, what, what, if, what if it comes yes. out in a way that you don't like? What would be the reinforcement? What would you then ask? I, I'm not asking, this is nothing technical. What I'm asking, this is a visual thing okay. just to make Nick McGee of the planning board very happy yep. so I can see what and a five acre parcel looks like on yeah, most of the most of the areas is corn in here so it, yeah because this is what happens is you're going to have to be you know 120 feet away we'll say you know you, even if you were granted yeah, the, the worst case, case. The worst case. Yeah. i want to see what that new piece of property looks like and where that tower is looking so uh, so if we have this box i just want to make sure we put it just a color box okay. Okay. Just, just, all right, we'll, we'll do kind of a representative box. Something. All he wants to do is see it. I just want to see it. That's all. That's all. Okay. We'll make a big thing. Just want to see it. Anything else? Do you need anything else from us right now? I don't think so. I think we're good. We'll follow up with Dan and Jay and um, get the appropriate revisions on the plan, do some of the DP and the response to the But I think it's just a few of what are in terms of things and get it back to you for the next I think we're moving closer to the final approval. Super. That's that you know, based on the other comments that you made, we're moving very close to the final okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, having said that, and having gone through that process, and we need to go through it again, I'm taking a five minute break. Yes. Ten minutes.
existing towers to see if um, the, the carriers in question can be accommodated and for coverage improvements on existing tower. Then you look to the industrial uh, districts, and that was a part of the discussion, um, certainly on this one, is there's a light industrial district um, in fairly close proximity to, uh, to this property, which is in the overlay. Um, so I think the board, uh, with guidance from uh, Wood and Kern and the applicant, um, can discuss you know, what are the coverage improvements um, uh, through the PRF analysis, et cetera, that, that make the, the location of the fish and game site and the overlay um, superior <coughs> enough to, to choose that location over the light industrial zone nearby. Um, and then consider, you know, if telecommunication facilities uh, serve the purpose, those are the antennas attached to buildings, etc., that um, can serve more specific areas, not as broad an area, um, before deciding on this location. So I encourage the board to kind of talk through that and, and um, kind of come to consensus on, on that particular step um, with guidance again from the applicant we're in current review and staff. And then if you decide that this is the, the proper um, location in the overlay, then you can uh, review, uh, much like the last application, kind of the, the details of, of the, the tower proposal in terms of um, the view um, with the bloom test, deciding between the 130 and 150 or something in between um, to allow for this provider or carrier as well as future ones for co-location. Talk about um, tower aesthetics, um, <coughs> uh, mono, uh, monopole or monopline or others that uh, make sense, etc. cetera. So um, this one's, I think, so to kind of solidify your prior location, then you can turn your attention to those um, site-specific details. And uh, in terms of staff comments, other than that, I think this one's I would say uh, similar in that you know, there's a carrier or two, and it sounds like there's two now um, that are comfortable at, at certain heights, um, but we do want to plan for a future co-location if possible as sort of visit, visit, um, in terms of visually acceptable, I should say. And so thinking about either you know, installing 150, uh, a base that can accommodate a 150 foot tower, or installing a taller tower at the outset, you know, whatever the board's preference is in terms of um, fitting into the landscape um, and giving guidance on that would be wise at this point. So with that introduction, I'll turn that to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to the applicant, uh, uh, Ms. Argus has, has left, so Mr. Bealey will now be a voting member. And now we'll turn it over to the applicant. Surprise with the second tower here, and we know we lost one person. <laughs> I hope. Well, I can see most of you come back. <laughs> you, I hope you you got learned a lesson from the discourse that happened. We we we're, we're paying very careful attention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, again, my name is John Springer. I'm the Springer Law Enforcement Manager. Uh, I'm not a main attorney, but uh, I do a lot of tower work, uh, which is why American Tower is a uh, disaster. Can't lose sight of it. I'm joined by Louis Vitale of American. Uh, I do want to, I know it's late, uh, you've already dealt with one tower site, I want to try to focus like a laser beam on the issues that I think uh, Mr. Bacon uh, raised, the staff report raised. Um, we do want to talk about the uh, uh, priority location issue, the four tiers. Uh, if I could take one step back, last hearing uh, when we were in front of you, I believe at the end of May, uh, we had submitted the Burnham Road plot, the RF plot. Uh, we have it up here on the board. Again, um, there was a question about uh, in the first round of staff reports whether the Burnham Road site worked for us because there was an existing tower there. And as you know, one of the things we have to show is that we cannot use existing towers. AT&T cannot use existing towers. And the Burnham Road plot shows where the Burnham Road site is, the orange dot right there. And it shows the coverage from that site. Um, the Fish and Game site is down here. Um, and this is, in rough approximation, the gap we're trying to cover. So you can see from the Burton Road site, because of the distance from the target area, it really doesn't bring coverage into the coverage gap. And so, uh, and, and I 
think would infer and agrees with that. I think the staff agrees with that. Uh, Burden Road is really not uh, a viable alternative. I would note that this RF plot is run at 119 feet, which is the, to our understanding, the first or the highest available slot on that path. So uh, we think that shows pretty conclusively that uh, Burden Road is not a viable candidate. <coughs> We submitted to the board a packet of supplemental information, uh, and I understand uh, Mr. Bacon and, and Wooden and Curtin um, reviewed that and issued a, a memo uh, dated, I believe, August 3rd, um, addressing the priority of locations issue. Um, the staff report said that during the board's May deliberation, uh, members expressed general general level of comfort that uh, there were no existing transmission towers uh, that we could use that ties in the Burden Road plot I just said. Uh, that's the first tier. Uh, the uh, staff report also said that uh, we could not uh, meet uh, that burden or, or use the tier that is uh, the new telecommunications facility. Uh, that's actually the third tier. So what I'd like to do right now, uh, assuming everybody agrees with that, I'd like to focus in on the, um, the issue, the second tier, which is the industrial or light industrial zone tier. Um, and we submitted um, our supplemental packet. I'm assuming everybody has that. Uh, if not, we have extra copies of this. Uh, it's at tab 2B. Uh, it's entitled Fish and Game LI Zone Narrative. And it has uh, a copy of this plot, which I just put up on the poster board as well. Um, I would note um, there are um, <clears throat> a couple of plots we wish to talk about on this issue. And uh, as Mr. Bacon said, it's our position, and I, I think it's a fair statement to say that would it incur and, and the staff don't, um, don't dispute this, but uh, the fish and game site is a superior site from an RF perspective, radio frequency perspective, for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, uh, the fish and game site, and it's not shown on this plot, but is really very centrally located within the gas. If you remember from our initial uh, application, on the RF plots, the, um, the red dot or the green dot for the fish and game site is really right in the middle of the gap. And I'm just picking one at, at random, so to speak. But this is an RF plot we showed. And the blue coverage is from the fish and game site. And that's really the coverage gap they're trying to address. And the fish and game site is, the again, the red dot right in the middle. Um, you really can't get more centrally located than that. And that's important to understand because uh, some of the issues I'm about to talk about flow from the location, if you will, of the fish and game site being so centrally located. The closest portion, if you will, of the LI zone is about three-tenths of a mile south. But when you move that distance down, it shifts the RF coverage as well. And it has some negative, shifting it down has some negative impacts. I put on the board here what we have as plot one, and we've highlighted in yellow what's called the focus zone in that supplemental material. It's, it's really one in the one, Gorham Road, there's Gorham Road right there. And the fishing game site is approximately down here. The LI zone is down here further. And um, one of the advantages to the fish and game site as opposed to the LI zone is because it covers more population. Um, this is important because every federally licensed carrier as a condition of their license has to try to cover as much population as possible in layman's terms. And if you look at the materials we sent in, just in this zone here, um, the fish and game has higher population count, it has a higher population percentage, 
um, than the LI zone, uh, which is further to the south. Um, the other, uh, another reason why the fish and game site is superior from an RF perspective is the overlap and coverage issue. And actually, before I leave this plot, um, as, you, as it says in the report, um, the green areas here are the areas that are only afforded coverage from the fish and game site, and the blue areas are the areas that are only afforded coverage from the LI zone site. And the red is basically the oval. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, um, the LI zone that we're talking about, we're really in the very corner of it. We're at the closest, almost the closest part of that LI zone to the fish and game site. So it's almost, from our perspective, when we're addressing the priority of locations, a worst case scenario, if you will. It's kind of a strong term, but you get the idea. If we went further away from the fish and game site, deeper into the LI zone, these differences that I'm talking about would become more pronounced. In other words, uh, there would be less population covered up, coverage up here, more of a gap, which I'm going to talk about along Warren Road, uh, and more of an overlap, which I'm about to talk about. So when we're talking about the comparison between the fish and game site and the LI zone, we're using a part of the LI zone that's really the most difficult for us to address, if you will. If we moved a mile deeper into the LI zone, uh, it, would, it would stand in more stark contrast, if you will. Um, the second table in the supplement um, is the overlap in coverage uh, from the fish and game site. And I have to apologize because I, I think it got swapped out of time, but we had submitted the initial supplement with the wrong caption on it. But um, the first in the supplement on page two of tab B, the first plot here should be entitled Fish and Game Overlap Coverage, not LI Zone Overlap Coverage. That's a mistake on our part, and I apologize for that. I think that was correct. correct. But if you look at the um, that table, the overlap in coverage between the fish and game site here and other surrounding sites that AT&T is on is shown in blue. And we calculated that to be just over 9.8 square miles. The overlap in coverage from the LI zone, which is now down here, um, is about twice that. It's, it's just over 17 miles, not almost twice. The reason that's not a good thing is because you're trying to minimize the overlap in coverage because you get what's called pilot pollution. You get essentially confusion between the two towers as to which tower should handle the call. So the RF engineers try to avoid or try to minimize tower overlap or coverage overlap as much as possible. And here we have it almost twice as much from the fishing game, or excuse me, fishing uh, from the LI zone, as we do from the fishing game zone. And again, a lot of that flows from the fact that the fishing game zone, or fishing game site, is more centrally located within the gap. Um, and we have uh, Chip Burdett is still here. Horizon has indicated that uh, they are interested in this site. Um, they are looking at the fishing game site quite actively. Uh, they may have indicated that they think uh, the fishing game site works better for them as well from an RF perspective, and that as we move further site south, um, that site does not work as well for them either. Uh, so for all those reasons, uh, we feel that the fishing game site is much better from an RF perspective than the LI zone. Um, and we think for that reason we do meet the priority location issue um, in our favor. I would note that we're not going to address it right now until we move past this, uh, but from a visual standpoint, which is like, to my understanding, a big reason why the priority location was instituted, uh, we think the fish and game site works a lot better than the LI. Um, so, I would be happy 
happy to address any questions that the has on the priority of location issue. I'm trying to, like I said, focus my comments and narrow my comments as much as possible because I know you've got two more things on the agenda behind us, and, and this is, I think, a rather narrow issue. Be happy to address any comments, Mr. Chair, or, or I can address the general standards. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Before I can go into the board, I just was reminded this is also open to public comment. So if there's anybody from the public who would like to address this first issue, by all means, again, uh, come up, give us your name, your address, try to keep your comments limited to five minutes. And any subsequent speaker, not repeat what the previous speaker has said. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to address the board? Hearing none, I close the public uh, comment. And now, you, you, you had a question last time, so I'm going to start with you as far as the priority of location. So, I think that's fair, Mr. Chair. So, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but I also are I'm looking at the pictures, and it, it is hard for me to think that um, the new site, yeah, I, this is a tough one. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. However, there's still the light industrial zone very close by that solves most of your problem. So, what you're, what you're, I, what I feel right now is I'm hearing this is ideal for us, um, and I get that. But I think the LI zone is workable, and I think that's a, that's kind of a stumbling block. And I know you're trying to overcome it. I also part of me, and this is just a general comment from the board to, to hear it before anyone makes up their mind of whether or not this passes the muster, is we're it's much easier to get something through in the LI zone on, on this topic. So. Do I believe that these guys are going to take the harder route because they think it's more fun to deal with me, or <laughs> are they really say telling us we'd rather we'd rather be here because it is more beneficial? It is a little bit more comforting to hear as well that there would be a co-location potential on this because that means one less tower, one less time I have to look at these plotted maps and annoy people. So. I'm on the fence. Um, I'm going to listen to my colleagues. Um, I'll wait to hear some more comment. But um, right now, I'm I'm on the fence, and I'll see uh, I'll see what everyone else has to say. But thank you. I appreciate the information. But uh, thank you. Um, actually, I I tend to agree with your presentation, um, the uh, explanation for the uh, coverage and everything. I think we're fortunate uh, that we have a um, piece of land like the Fisher Game. Where we will not, you know, we don't have residents that we have to deal with, as far as I know. Um, and uh, it seems like it's going to provide the optimum amount of coverage that you folks are looking for. And uh, so I, I, I really don't have a, a big issue. I think I'm all set right now. Thank you. Um, I too think that the uh, fishing game location is superior to the LI zone. Now, even though the zone viewers uh, rather um, wants us to look very carefully at avoiding the, uh, the zone that the fishing game is in, um, I would hate to just overly concentrate on the LI zone just because it's the LI zone. Um, and it does come down to, in many cases, it does come down to aesthetics. And uh, I know we'll be talking more about that later. But we can't avoid the fact that I don't think anyone would care where these cell towers were and how high they were and how many there were if there was no aesthetic issues. You can't see them. Exactly. So um, the fact that um, the Fish and Game site is uh, more aesthetically pleasing leads me to believe that, and it fits your coverage purposes um, quite well, and it leads me to believe that there's more potential for us to potentially talk about height, talk about co-location, and thus reduce uh, <coughs> potential impacts from future interested parties. So uh, I'm satisfied with the presentation. I like the Michigan Game Thank you. Sure. 
kind of agree with Nick to a point. But the purpose of the standard is basically to have the right location and visual effects. To me, it really should be in the light industrial. We have given us enough evidence uh, coverage-wise. And I get into details, but I won't. Uh, the other members feel that fish and game is fine as far as the visual effects, so I'll just be glad to go on. Yeah. For some reason, today I'm this this like place yet. Yeah. Um, I also like the fish and game uh, location better than the LI. So, uh, part of what was presented by the board, part about the technical aspects, which I don't understand to any great degree, but I do understand the overlap and the double overlap versus that location. So, uh, for that reason, uh, I, I think that the fish and game and food. Uh, would be a better location. It has less of an impact on my abutters, and uh, uh, I think there's a better chance for a uh, co location with another company. I'm glad to hear that you see guys talk to one another uh, so that uh, uh, there is that potential there. So, how do we do with this? I mean, there's two members who. The three members that uh, favoring the uh, fish and game, and two who would rather see it in the LI. Uh, I'll go over the fish and game. I'm just saying officially. And if you're looking at it, I would prefer that. Part of the standard is the visual effects. The spirit of the fish and game is probably a better location as far as that goes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so, okay. So, I think. You know, the consensus of the board is that we're okay with the fish and game, so that we move on now to the other ordinance standards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, board. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to spend a little time on the visual aspects of it, but first, Mr. Chair, if I may, just give a general overview of the site. Um, and we submitted um, site plans. Uh, one of the issues, there were several issues that uh, both uh, staff and, and Woodard and Kern came up with in terms of the width of the uh, access easement, which we've now confirmed is uh, 20 feet wide, uh, size of the equipment shelter, which we've now found, et cetera. But I, I think it's fair to say that um, overall, um, I think they like the site plans as they were presented. Um, I put up on the board sheet C101, uh, which I think is a good overview of the property and where the uh, where the access and utilities are going to be. Um, this is the fishing canyon club. Um, Holmes Road is down here. Uh, there's going to be access from the existing drive uh, coming in, uh, there's the clubhouse to go past. Uh, we have a 75 foot by 75 foot lease compound uh, sorted to the rear of the buildings, if you will, uh, which is shown there. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about how this technology works, etc., because you got some of that from Verizon already. I think if you understand that, I'd be happy to talk about that in particular, if you wish. Um, the um, circle here on sheet 101 is the 150 foot setback, uh, what I always call the fall zone. Um, we have to be away from the property line, which we are, as shown by that. Uh, the only utilities that we're going to need, this is an unmanned facility, the compound is an unmanned facility, so we don't need water or sewer. Uh, we only need telephone and electric. Um, the, uh, those can be run from the existing services from Holmes Road. We're going to be doing the utilities underground. Um, we're 280 feet to the closest property line to the east over here. Uh, we are 500 feet from the rear lot line, uh, about 1,000 feet to the south, and 1,500 feet 
from the west. Um, if you go to sheet C102, you get a better, more close, closer view, if you will, of the compound. Um, the, uh, there's a parking and turnaround area here, and uh, that circle right there is the proposed monopole. Um, one of the reasons we situated it where we did is because this will allow us not only to meet all the setbacks we have to meet, but also a minimum clearing will be necessary because we, we have a very limited uh, access drive, if you will, uh, in utility easement. Um, the, uh, uh, the wetlands have been delineated and, uh, and we meet all the wetland setbacks as well as the wetland buffers. Um, the <clears throat> only traffic to this type of facility is uh, after construction one or two trips per month uh, per carrier, uh, usually in an SUV or passenger vehicle. Um, and the tower is not going to be lit. Uh, there will be safety lighting on the equipment shelter or the equipment cabinets, if you will, but the tower itself will not be lit. Um, the, there's no noise, no smoke, no fumes, uh, except for the visual impact. It's a pretty, uh, pretty passive use. Um, sheet 103 gives a good side view of the mock pole. Um, the top, uh, we showed 130. We'd like to talk to you about 150, which I'll do in a minute. Um, the, uh, if we had to use a 130 pole, um, AT&T would have a center line of its antennas at 126. Uh, each carrier needs 10 feet of separation below that. So at 130 feet, you're looking at 126. Verizon would be at 116, and then below that, uh, 10 feet of separation. If there are two more, two more slots. At 130, we proposed a four-carrier pole. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the compound area, we're showing one equipment shelter here, which would be AT&T. Um, the way this works, you may know, with the handset, where your personal device communicates with the antennas, and the antennas communicate back to you. The signal goes up to the antennas, into the antennas, down cables, into the, cave, into the equipment cabinet or equipment shelter, where it ties into a landline, and then your call is just routed out to wherever you're talking. And if we site it properly, and like this site is right in the middle of the gap, and you have no significant gaps in coverage, as you travel down the road, if you're in your car as a passenger, not as a driver, <laughs> New Hampshire just had hands-free, which I think is a good idea. Um, you get your, your phone or your device gets handed off from tower to tower to tower as you move from one RF footprint to the other. Uh, the compound's gonna have an eight foot chain link fence um, and uh, AT&T uses an equipment shelter which is 11 and a half by 16. Um, some uh, carriers use cabinets on pads, um, but uh, for now, we're just showing the equipment shelter uh, for AT&T. Um, the compound uses gravel or crushed stone for the base. Um, there um, is no pedestrian travel, um, and as I said, it's a, it's a very passive use, uh, apart from the Good thing about this site, in our opinion, is it does have limited visual impact. Um, I've done a lot of these hearings. Um, in my opinion, the first rule of zoning powers is the visual impact is directly proportional to the number of people who come out to complain about. Um, we have no one. I don't know if anybody's ever planned to come out about this site, but I been publicly noticed and you don't have anybody coming out saying, I don't want to look at that thing, it's a pretty good site right off the bat. That doesn't mean you can't put us to our proof. That doesn't mean you shouldn't look at this very carefully, but I, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. Um, but uh, uh, the 
the loan test that we submitted, we submitted two at this point. Uh, with the initial application, it was 130 feet. Uh, with the supplemental application, it was at 150 feet. Um, we're happy to do 150 feet. Uh, and actually, after seeing the 150 foot balloon test, we think that makes a lot of sense here. Um, we can do 130 with an extendable pole. Um, quite honestly, we would prefer not to do that. We, we, we prefer 150, but if the board limits us to 130, we can do it as an extendable. Um, but it is a process to extend it. Once you build it, you build it so the foundation supports 150. Uh, and as I think you heard in the prior application, you know, you essentially build it like you're doing 150 pole, but you only do it 130. The problem is you, then extending it, uh, you have carriers on there who have to redo their cabling. Uh, you got to redo the leases because they're going for a different slot on a different tower. Uh, it's, it's sort of a pain in the neck. Um, we think 150 does work here because of the location uh, and the lack of visual impact. But we will do it either way. This uh, part of the 130 foot balloon test is a predictive analysis, uh, which basically says this is where we think you're going to see this tower. Um, it's based on topography. Um, and I think this shows the um, with no tree cover or vegetation considered. So this is really a worst case scenario, if you will. The red shows where, based on topography, um, that they believe the tower will be visible at 130 feet, the tower being the uh, sort of purple uh, triangle in the middle. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's really pretty limited. Uh, this is a, uh, if you can see this blue, line, blue circle here, um, I believe that's a one mile radius circle, yes. There's a one mile radius circle here. There's a half mile radius circle there. And there's the tower. And if you look at the 150 foot predictive analysis, same assumptions, topography, it, it, it assumes topography only, it takes into account topography only, it doesn't take into account tree cover. So this is really, again, the worst case scenario. And you can see when I put the 150 on top, it's really not much more than what you can see from the 130. Um, and again, there's the one mile radius right there. So most of the predictive visibility uh, is further away, uh, which is, again, now that I can really talk about the visual impact, uh, now that we're through the priority locations issue, um, this is a great site. This is a this is a great site. It's tucked away on, on a large. I didn't say this, but it's over 200 acre site. Uh, it's heavily wooded. Uh, it's private property, and uh, it's, it's well located. So this is what we would consider a very limited visual impact. And as you can see from the bottom 130 to the top 150, um, there's really not much difference. Probably a little bit not much. Um, the, Mr. Chair, um, I can walk through the pictures from the visual study if you wish. If the board has had an opportunity to examine them in detail, I, I don't want to take your time, but if you haven't done that, I think it is instructive because obviously one of the issues you have to deal with is whether you know it's 130 or 150. I'd be happy to go through those pictures. I can do it fairly quickly if, you, if the board hasn't done it yet. What's the desire of the board? I look at it. I'm okay. I see. I see. No, we're okay. Um, Uh, it probably will to a certain degree. 
height, your RF coverage would expand. Um, so probably would a little. Um, the sort of counterbalancing factors from the town's point of view is obvious, maybe I shouldn't say obvious, but you're creating better and more co-location slots beneath them. Um, I have to be honest with you, at, if you're at 130, the slots would go uh, 126, 116, 106, 96. When you're at 96, that's a pretty low height from an RF perspective. Um, based on this tree cover, I don't think, I don't know what you're going to get below at 96, certainly, and at 96, I think I could foresee carriers come and say 96 doesn't really work for us. If you're starting at 150 and you're going 146, 136, 126, now your fourth carrier is at 116, well that's still, you know, probably 30 to 40 feet above the tree cover. That's still a good slot. I don't think there's any question from this side. Uh, that's really where the benefit is. Uh, and you could go down to 106 and even 96, you know, if you need six carriers, you know, five or six carriers on that pole. Uh, I personally think any time you get below 100 feet, I mean, just as a general statement, depends on the site, depends on the topography, et cetera. Any time you get below 100 feet, you're pretty low. Um, but um, that's sort of a long answer to the question. I think, yes, to a certain degree, there is a little more. Um, it, I don't think it's going to double. It's not going to be that dramatic. Like the LI zone does double at 130. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to address the, the, the general standards after the height and the visibility, if you wish, or I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, can I just keep going through the, the criteria to show you how we meet them? I'll be keep going pretty pretty brief. I'll try to be brief. Um, under the uh, tower ordinance, the general standards after the uh, priority locations is the height. Um, it can be 130 feet. You can go up to 150 feet um, if uh, uh, <coughs> if the board finds that um, there is no visual impact as a result of that. Um, I think that's, uh, I'm, so, I'm looking for the language, sorry, I should have highlighted it. It says the planning board may allow the standard height limit to be exceeded by up to an additional 20 feet to a maximum of 150 feet if the increase in height enables the co-location of additional antennas that otherwise could not be accommodated on the tower and results in no material increase, no material increase in the visual impacts tower and I think there's a good case to be made that we meet that criteria uh, to go up to 150 feet. Uh, second uh, standard in the tower uh, ordinance is the minimum lot size and setback. Uh, the minimum lot size is 25 acres. Our host property is 206 I believe. Uh, there's a we meet it at 130 and we also meet it at 150. We do not have to change the location of the tower we don't have to change the plans. Uh, we meet the 150-foot uh, uh, tower setback, 150% uh, of tower height setback, even at 150. Um, the next criteria is buffering. Um, all transmission towers shall be surrounded by a buffer of dense tree growth and vegetation. Um, we feel that's the case here. Um, that's why we cited it where we did. Um, we feel we meet that criteria. Um, the next criteria is visual impact analysis. Um, I'm not going to go over that given our discussion just now, other than to say, for the record, we've submitted uh, visual studies at both 130 feet and 150 feet, uh, and we feel that uh, they've, they've come out very well and shown that there is no uh, visual impact or very minimal visual impact uh, from this site. Um, tower style uh, is the next criteria. Um, it says the tower type shall be limited to monopole style towers standard in sky tone and earth, above the surrounding trees and earth tone below treetop. Um, we are proposing a single freestanding monopole tower here. Um, the equipment shelter will have a light stone-like finish. 
Um, we propose that the tower and the antennas be a brushed gray uh, finish. Uh, we're happy to talk to you about different colors, but um, in our opinion, the brushed gray is best against the sky. Uh, I do want to talk two seconds about a monopine because you talked about that a lot with the first applicant tonight. Uh, in our opinion here, the monopine doesn't work as well uh, for several reasons, certainly if you go up to 150 feet. But I think the monopine is more um, attractive an option, if you will, in that first situation where you are directly abutting a residential neighborhood uh, and where you, quite frankly, have people coming out saying we want a monopine, I, or yeah, we want a monopine, I understand it's the board's decision, not uh, the audience decision, uh, but in our case, given the limited visual impact here, uh, we think that the monopole works much better. I would agree with, and I forget her name at the end of the board, but uh, her discussion about um, Sal, Susan August, uh, you know, at 130 feet, I don't think you're going to fool anybody at 150 feet or not. And my personal opinion is that it adds more fault and draws more attention. Um, and Mr. Vitale pointed out as well, we were talking about it uh, during the first application, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do an extendable tower with the monopoly because the shape of the monoprime is sculpted, if you will, or created based on the 130 height. And then you go up another 20 feet and you got to start it all over again. So um, we believe that uh, the monoprime is not as attractive an option here and should not be used. Um, the next criteria is the lighting. Um, we are not uh, proposing any lights on the tower. Um, we have FAA done an FAA review, we do not have to light the tower at 130 feet, we're very confident that we don't have to do it at 150 feet. So we've already done it at, thank you, at uh, 150 feet and, and we're not going to light the tower. Uh, the only lighting, as I said before, would be on the equipment cabinets or the uh, equipment shelters for the personnel, maybe 75 watt or something like that. Uh, the next uh, criteria is co-location. Uh, talked about this before. At 130, we've designed this to hold four total carriers, including AT&T. Um, I would think at 150, we could do five or six um, and create those additional co-location spots. Uh, the next criteria is advertising. Uh, we're not going to have any advertising on here. The only signage would be small warning signs and identification signs on the countdown. Um, the Next criteria is the coverage, um, RF coverage analysis. Uh, we submitted a number of plots, RF plots, uh, along with our first um, uh, report, first RF report. Um, the, those of that tab B of the initial application, um, I'd be happy to go through those in detail. Uh, we saw some of it already with those other boards. Um, Rarely do you get a site so perfectly located in the middle of a significant gap in coverage. Uh, the plots uh, show uh, that this site at the Fish and Game uh, location really perfectly covers uh, significant gap in coverage. Um, the structural standards is the next criteria. Um, we have to meet the EIA structural standards, which we will do. Um, next criteria is existing towers, and as I said earlier, um, we have, in the RF report, showed that there are no existing towers that we can use, and in fact, of most of the surrounding towers, except for the Burnham Road site, uh, at and is already on them, um, and already using those existing towers. Um, the last criteria um, that applies to us is abandonment. Uh, we will Produce a uh, what's called a removal bond. We talked about this in the horizon uh, in the first application. Uh, we will post a bond that says that uh, if this site becomes abandoned and uh, Mariner does not remove it as required to do, uh, the bond will be there so that the town can essentially call a bond and remove the town itself. Um, the, I think those are all the tower standards um, that are applied. Uh, I'll be happy to continue.
continue through the site plan review standards, Mr. Chair. Or answer any questions. I'm on a roll. I know people are on the edge of their seat. Enthralled by this presentation. I think before you get to that, I'm going to do things a little differently. Yep. Because I've been taking notes. I'm going to pull the board on each of those questions. Okay. Rather than each of you having to be individual. So let's go with the height number one. 150 feet versus 130 feet. Anybody have any comments on that? I'm in favor of 150 foot. 150. I have a question. Sure. Currently, AT&T is the only one that must be situated on this pole. They want it at 126. Is that correct? Yes. That's their ideal? That's their sweet spot? Well, I guess I would say yes to a certain degree. I don't think they'd object to going higher. They like 126. My opinion is I'm in favor of 130. Okay. I go with 150. I also go with 150 because of the co-location. And not having to have a year, two years, three years from now, somebody having to come back and go through the whole process all over again. Especially in this location. My opinion is that it does more than 150 now. And so we can avoid that. And we can get as many other players under the current circumstances. So I think that's a four to one for 150. The buffering. What's up here now as far as the topography is concerned? You're talking about the modified, but what's up here now? For topography? Are you talking about above ground level? Yeah. It was, we had a discussion with the staff about this because the fish and game site is, there's a difference of seven feet of elevation between the fish and game and LI. And I'll be darned if I can remember what the numbers were. I think we may have that. Anybody have any comments? Yeah. Are you basically asking if it's surrounded by trees? Well, I know that. But I mean, where's my pipe between the trees? I have no idea. Neither do I. Well, it's the pipe tree state. I mean, does anybody have any? So we can guess the majority is probably fine. Does anybody have any comments on that? Okay. We've gone, we went beyond the 25 acre requirement and 150% even at whatever, yeah, setback. Anybody have any questions on the tower style and color? I think a monopole is the best for this location. Well, we expect to cut off fixtures for any lighting 